Dámy a pánové, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in the second uh, panel. My name is Hanna tesak -Vrtala. I am representing the project Facts on Climate Change, and I will be the moderator of this panel. As it has been already mentioned, we will speak about the future, and we will have five guests. We will speak about the energy security development of renewable resources, enhancement of the European Transmission Network, also, the top, we will cover the topic of the community energy uh, and so on. Today, the, we have here Martin Jurushek, uh, the um, um, professor at the, uh, from the Masaryk University in Brno. Then, uh, Chris uh, Werslow from the think tank Amber. Pavel Scholz, um, member of the board of CHEPS company. Martin Bursik, the co-founder of uh, the Renewable Resources Chamber, and uh, Eliška Beranova, the lawyer from the team of the Responsible Energy uh, from uh, Frenbog. Let me give the floor to Martin Jurushek, who will start with his first presentation. Uh, thank you for invitation and for the possibility to speak in this panel. And in fact, thank you also for organization of this uh, very uh, actual um, conference. The development in Ukraine and all the things related to this crisis have uh, shown us how uh, this topic is important at present time. At the same time, I would like to thank the um, Senate uh, to uh, serve as a good example, not heating in this room. And I, I believe we can stand it, and it's a good example um, which should be followed. I also made some comments uh, from the first panel, which I believe could be a good introduction to this panel. I am involved in the uh, study of uh, um, energy security and geopolitics um, um, issues. And I am very glad that Jaromanski mentioned one important thing which uh, needs to be changed. The energy policy of the EU was um, focusing on the inner issues. And today we see the weakness of uh, these um, separated energy policies um, compared to some, um, some co uh, co co cooperation and collective uh, structure. And I believe that the EU would have more difficult situation in this geopolitical uh, environment, and there will be more strife for the common shared approaches in the frame of EU. I will also cover this topic in my presentation. There is another thing which uh, has been mentioned here, that the geopolitical perspective is uh, the, um, um, the framework which affects the energy policy. In fact, uh, we had, I believe, a wrong approach because we considered the strategic approach as the thing which uh, is related to the Cold War, and we uh, have to focus on other things. And in the recent years, I focused on geopolitics, and, uh, on the uh, in, uh, activities of Russia in the area of uh, energy, security, and so on. And sometimes I got some feedbacks to my studies saying that it has been already solved because geopolitics is not the topic today. Now we are dealing with the 
functions of market, whether the market is functional. And now we have to solve the things um, uh, as the energy policy, the market prices, and so on. And today, uh, suddenly, geopolitics comes back. And I'm saying it doesn't come back. It used to be here always. And in energy, that's the geopolitics uh, which we can see every day. This traditional geopolitics which focused on the fossil fuels, uh, and we know there are limited volumes of them, and that's why they are distributed uh, unequally. This gives the um, possibility of the political influencing uh, uh, from the side of those who possess these uh, fuels. And we have not um, uh, approached these matters from this angle and from this perspective for a long time. As already mentioned, I would like to expand the name of this conference um, sustainably, affordably, and safe. So this means that we need to have the sufficient supplies of the sufficient uh, diversity of commodities for the acceptable prices uh, with uh, the minimum effect of uh, any externalities. But the energy uh, security can be associated with the uh, securitization where we come to the sphere of geopolitics. The question is, uh, what's the situation of the Czech Republic? Czech Republic is a very energy intensive and emission intensive market compared to your, uh, other countries of Europe. And as uh, compared to the countries of OECDs, we are one of the most uh, energy um, demanding and uh, the most energy uh, consuming country uh, per capita. So uh, sometimes it's said that we are small and the big countries should make an effort. Uh, that's true. But if we uh, recalculate all that to uh, the unit of GDP and uh, mm, when we see how it looks like per capita, we see that there is the great um, space uh, for improvement. You know, our position is affected by our uh, geographic um, location. You know, development which uh, focused here after the Second World War where uh, there was industrialization, heavy industry was uh, introduced, and in fact, this is the heritage we have to cope with at this moment. So this is one of the reasons why the Czech Republic is more uh, sensitive uh, to uh, the uh, economic fluctuations, also in respect of the supplies of raw materials. and. We uh, are depending also on the energy uh, uh, resources. So Mr. Ravensky here mentioned uh, this uh, recoupling of the development and consumption of uh, energies. And at the same time, there is the phenomenon of the supply of energy uh, resources. This is the challenge which we are facing at this moment. The energy transition is the challenge which has a longer span uh, of um, uh, its uh, perspective. As regards the fossil uh, fuels, the Czech Republic is dependent on supplies of oil and uh, natural gas. These are the key uh, resources of energy for our country, and the structural dependence is caused by the fact that the customer is dependent on uh, the uh, uh, on the supply structure on the. Uh, for the infrastructure, which is much more um, felt compared to other kinds of fuels. So the physical infrastructure of Europe suffers with the lack of interconnection. Uh, and as regards the gas, 
we are limited in the storage capacities and it's also to mention that the gas is affecting uh, the uh, very sensitive uh, industries if the natural gas is used for the heating it is uh, it turns to the political issue because um, uh, thousands of inhabitants uh, then uh, suffer with any price fluctuation of uh, the natural gas prices. Russian invasion to uh, Ukraine has turned to the catalyst of changes which could be considered even positive. It means that we are cutting off the dependence uh, on the import uh, from unstable market, it means from Russia. Here, the two groups which discussed uh, the topics of uh, energy transition and energy security are coming closer to each other. And the same process is um, happening at the level of uh, EU level. In the past, we uh, monitored the fact that uh, the market functioning was the main topic and uh, the political dependence and um, uh, was uh, aside of the attention. So it seemed for a long time that these two groups in EU were unable to come closer in their posi uh, positions. But uh, now we see that these two groups in EU are coming closer and in fact are uh, being unified. Because we have the discussion, yes, abandoning fossil uh, fuels, uh, yes, uh, abandoning fossil uh, fuels coming from Russia. So, uh, speaking about the outlook uh, to the future, it's uh, probable that the consumption of fossil fuels will stagnate and rather decrease um, in the frame of EU, maybe we will see some fluctuations in the area of emissions. Uh, maybe you notice that some countries are planning to um, reopen some of the uh, coal um, facilities. Uh, sure, it will not be uh, huge uh, amounts. This will be some uh, uh, small resources and small facilities, and in uh, no way we can speak about the renaissance of the coal industry. As regards the uh, first panel, which uh, was discussed here, um, I believe uh, Mr. Uh, Rowinsky said that we should abandon the previous energy concept. In the previous energy concepts, uh, the independence was considered to be one of the key features that we should be uh, independent in production of the um, electricity and uh, um, energies. I believe that this approach should be expanded. Uh, we should uh, in fact, uh, um, function in the framework of regions and maybe in uh, the in framework of uh, EU. Speaking about flexibility, and here I mean flexibility in electricity uh, sector and flexibility and interconnections is uh, required. We see that we need to have connections uh, to various directions of supplies to be able to mitigate possible risks and uh, to be able to shift uh, the supplies uh, from uh, one place to another. It has been also mentioned here that there needs to be also the flexibility of the 
local distribution uh, networks and uh, that uh, there should be uh, the different approach to consumers and producers. Uh, so the para, uh, paradigm has been changed now because we now see that the uh, network should be able to operate in both directions. So it means that the producer uh, and the consumer who doesn't need uh, the electricity at this moment or the country which doesn't need certain uh, uh, share of electricity at the moment can um, send it to other countries and so on. Um, well, all these issues are also related to uh, the um, issues of uh, electromobility and to the issues of the renewable resources um, development. Uh, which will allow us then uh, to communicate better in this uh, respect. At the level of EU, um, let's say macro level, uh, it's um, uh, pleasant that the um, European Commission is uh, leading uh, the coordination of all these issues. On Thursdays, there will be some uh, a uh, council uh, meeting where the um, uh, common purchases of gas uh, will be discussed. Also, the uh, mechanism for the, the, the determination of the gas prices will be discussed. I would uh, say that um, we are turning now to the uh, better uh, coordination in this um, level. Well, in um, European Commission, the term which is used is not the common purchases or joint purchases of gas, but coordination of uh, purchases. So we see that there will be certain shift in the reallocation, reallocation of the political forces and uh, trading. So the role of the uh, European Commission will be really um, very important in this respect. I would like to thank you for your attention at this moment, and I will be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I will also look forward to the discussion. The next uh, guest will speak in English uh, through Zoom platform. It will be Klaas uh, Raslo from Amber Think Tank. So, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Ruslo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, if you'll give me a second, I will just arrange for you to see my slides of my presentation. Uh, this is working now. Um, so, yes, I'm Dr. Chris Ruslo, the think tank Ember. Um, and I'm here to speak about the European perspective and some of the possible pathways for Europe out of the current energy crisis. And I, I really aim to just to do one thing today, which is to convince you that clean energy provides the most secure and the most affordable routes out of the crisis, uh, again, with that, Euro with that whole European perspective. Uh, so let me begin. Uh, before I go into that topic, just some background on, on Ember, the think tank. So we are a global think tank and our overriding ambition is to help the world shift from, from coal and fossil electricity to clean power um, by 2040, which is what the world needs in order to, reduce, to limit greenhouse gases and global warming to 1.5 degrees C. <clears throat> so Europe is at a crossroads. Uh, we're, we have the energy crisis and there are many paths available out of the crisis. But I think one thing is very clear that the era of cheap fossil fuels uh, is, is over and it may not be coming back uh, ever or at least anytime soon. So every possible future for the European system uh, must reduce reliance on Russian fossil fuels for obvious reasons. But, uh, but the choice really is between two ways. Europe can either switch to alternative sources of fossil fuels or the alternative here, which I've, which I've called switch or ditch. We can continue or accelerate uh, progress in ditching fossil fuels for good using renewables and other forms of clean energy. And the decisions that are being taken now 
will really be make or break for Europe's climate targets. Uh, hence why I'm saying that Europe is at this important crossroads in its energy policy. And uh, there are several formal pathways that are being discussed that have been put forward by the European Commission. Um, and, and here are just some headline numbers explaining those different pathways. In every pathway, we see fossil fuel consumption reducing significantly. Uh, but even in the case of repower EU targets, um, the scenario that, that would not re reduce or displace uh, Russian fossil fuels entirely um, in the case of gas until 2027 for Europe. And that would require uh, new fossil fuel infrastructure in the form of LNG terminals, uh, which come with, with pretty clear uh, stranded asset risks uh, if Europe is to achieve net zero by 2050. And lots of research, uh, recent studies have shown that actually the maximum possible clean energy and efficiency targets uh, could take us even further than these formal scenarios that are being discussed. So fossil fuel consumption could be halved by 2030, and renewables could um, could provide uh, half or more of energy in Europe. Now, I'm saying this is possible, but over the next few slides, I, I hope to convince you it's not just possible, but this also uh, would be the best choice to go even faster than, the, faster than these already ambitious um, pathways for, for Europe. And I think there's one real concept at the heart of that reason, and the, the previous speaker touched on this, but I think what we have now, and it, this has really just happened in the last year, is a radically transformed case for clean energy and for renewables. So on the left-hand side of this diagram, this is the old view. Uh, and this was the case as recently as a few years ago, that um, in the energy system, there are three things that you need. Three things that are overwhelmingly important, which is security of energy, affordability of energy for consumers, uh, and of course, sustainability for the planet. And the old wisdom was that you could only ever choose two of these three things. So fossil fuels would give you affordability and security, or renewables would give you sustainability and affordability, but they could not be relied upon for security. And in the situation that Europe finds itself in today, um, actually renewables can deliver and are delivering on all three of these aspects. Uh, and then in the next three slides, I'll go into each of these aspects and, and make the case um, for why that is true. So on affordability, the, the increase in the cost of gas and the decrease in the cost of renewables means that today, for example, Onshore wind is seven times cheaper than power produced by gas. The cost of solar power uh, fell 80% over the last decade, making it now the most cheap and cost competitive form of power in, in many countries in Europe. As a result of those reductions in solar costs, the solar sector globally is growing exponentially. Um, the total amount of solar panels deployed next year is, is expected to be nearly 40% uh, sorry, this year expected to be 40% higher than last year. And this fourth number here is, is the most significant one, I think. So this is, but this is a number from some research that we recently did at Ember, where we modeled the entire European power system. And importantly, we looked at the costs involved in the transition of the entire power system. So not just renewables, but the costs of everything together. And our main finding was that by decarbonizing the European power sector by 2035. This could unlock 1 trillion euros in savings, mostly through avoided fossil fuel costs. So that was the affordability aspect, the second of the three, sustainability. Um, it may seem obvious that renewables and clean energy are sustainable by definition, but there's a bit more to it than that. So I've chosen to focus my talk on the, on the power sector, on electricity, uh, and there's a good reason for that. So this slide shows uh, some analysis of the most recent climate modeling pathways from the IPCC. Um, so this is the 
the uh, these are the pathways that the IPCC based their recommendations on. Um, so this is the most the most authoritative analysis of energy pathways uh, in the world. And for Europe, this is what they tell us. Um, they tell us that, of course, in all sectors, fossil fuels need to be phased out by 2050 uh, in, in accordance with Europe's net zero targets. But in the power sector, they're phased out first. And the reason for that is because clean power actually will drive decarbonization of many other sectors. So through electric vehicles and transport and uh, through heat pumps replacing fossil fuel boilers uh, in buildings, for example. Uh, another important reason is that the power sector has these mature solutions available. Wind and solar power are te technically mature um, and as I just described, are, um, are very cheap compared to the alternatives. And there is momentum towards, towards this happening. So uh, in the EU, we already have 11 countries that are aiming for um, 80% uh, renewable electricity by 2030, 80% or higher. And the third element is security. Now, these are some results from the same modeling exercise that I mentioned previously. Um, but I'm just showing these to, to really visualize how wind and solar hold the key to bringing back an energy production uh, in, into Europe. So Europe's reliance on fossil fuels, particularly Russian fossil fuels, uh, I think it's very clear now that that, that was a mistake. Um, and a, as a result of that reliance on, on gas and other fossil fuels, the transition to renewables in Europe um, did not go as fast as it could have done. Um, and what our modeling shows is the pathway to 2035 really is characterized by a huge expansion of wind and solar power. Uh, this can not only replace fossil fuels, but it can also drive an expansion of the power supply, which we need to, to fuel electric vehicles and other, other clean solutions. Uh, and this modeling also showed that wind and solar power can expand from a share of 20% today, and the whole European system can be secure with a share of 80% from wind and solar by 2035. And this is, let's not forget, once those, wind, once those wind turbines and solar panels are built, this is energy that is completely independent um, and immune from geopolitics, from energy blackmail, um, uh, like we're seeing from Vladimir, Vladimir Putin uh, and Russia. So I want to focus now on, on just two infrastructure challenges that I, I want to identify. Um, that we need to solve collectively as Europe to build this new future system. Uh, the first one is this expansion of wind and solar power. So what we find uh, from our modeling is that uh, by 2030, Europe needs to be adding between three and four times as many renewables to the system as we're currently doing now. Uh, and that would mean that the, the fleet of wind and solar power would increase from approximately 350 gigawatts uh, today to, to more like 1,000 by 2030. Um, this, of course, is a huge challenge. And I would say, in my view, this is a central challenge for the energy system in Europe. Um, and for Czechia, what that approximately would mean is uh, a quadrupling of the wind and solar fleets by, by 2030 very roughly speaking. The second challenge I want to highlight is the lack of interconnection. Uh, the previous speaker also mentioned this. Um, and this is for you know, a very simple reason that uh, the, re the resources for renewables in Europe are not evenly di distributed. So the north of Europe is very rich in, in wind power and the south of Europe very rich in solar power. So. Um, what we actually find is that uh, by increasing and expanding the network, we have a more um, uh, cost, cost efficient, cost optimal solution for sharing this power and ensure, ensuring supply and security of supply between countries. I think it's often interpreted as, as a weakness um, if one country is depending on another via, via interconnection, but actually I see it more as a, 
as kind of mutual strength, mutual support, um, and you know, each country helping helping their neighbours to to kind of provide that security of supply um, as the renewables output varies across Europe uh, in time and space. So thank you for your attention. I just want to conclude with with making some 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 points here, some re-emphasizing some points. Um, Europe's bet on gas as a bridge fuel uh, has backfired quite clearly. Uh, clean energy, I hope I've managed to convince you, is ready to fight uh, inflation, which is driven by energy, uh, to boost energy security, uh, and as well, of course, to tackle climate change. And cooperation will be needed to overcome these big infrastructure challenges, and solidarity will really underpin uh, this future energy system uh, based on renewables. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Damien. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are approaching the next uh, presentation, which will be uh, made by Pavel Schutz, uh, the uh, board member of CHEPS uh, company. Ladies and gentlemen, I have no presentation prepared. Nevertheless, I will speak about the possibilities uh, from the point of view of energy network operator. And I will react to uh, some statements made here. First of all, we have to realize that speaking about decarbonization, we are speaking about electrification, we are speaking about renewables, and we are speaking about uh, the hydrogen economy. I remember um, discussions when the present valid energy concept uh, uh, was uh, discussed and uh, Germans uh, planned uh, reduction of electricity uh, consumption. Uh, we uh, did not uh, take the same approach and uh, there were very uh, tough discussions. And today Germans uh, <coughs> believe that uh, the energy consumption will increase, uh, electricity consumption will increase. So <coughs> if uh, we um, want uh, to reach development, we have to replace fossil fuels in uh, many areas. Speaking about electrification, we come to the phenomenon of network, because energy uh, grid is uh, the grid which um, uh, <coughs> is uh, uh, ruled by the physical uh, loss or loss of physics, and we can't uh, bridge that. What we need to do to have the infrastructure robust enough for future. <clears throat> it has been mentioned here that uh, uh, <clears throat> the energy uh, self uh, um, uh, self sustainability would be enough uh, would be good, uh, but today we know that in respect of import, we will have a higher level of imports. So after 20 years of high exports, when we used to be the second uh, largest exporting um, um, economy, we will face the situation where we will importing uh, electricity for a long time. That's not a problem, but it has certain limits. The, uh, <coughs> the, trans uh, the uh, network, the transformation, uh, transmission network is able to uh, uh, cover about 25 percent of the needs, but not at any time. There, but there are some hours. Uh, when it can transmit uh, only 15%. So if we are not um, equipped with uh, the enough capacity, uh, there could be moments when we will be unable to uh, provide for the sufficient supply of energy. And uh, as regards the robustness of the network, the uh, Czech Republic's uh, transportation uh, network is interconnected. The bottlenecks are usually outside of the Czech Republic. We are um, 
facing it. Uh, at the moment when there is a lot of wind in Germany and the electricity is uh, cheap there, our market separates and all the electricity which could be imported is not imported, uh, but the problem lays not in our transmission capacity, but in the capacity of the German network. And the reason is that there is the bottleneck in the transmission network from the north to south. So it means that we will need to uh, develop the transmission network not only in the uh, national level, but in the, uh, the European level. Uh, so we have to consider the fact that all this uh, the capacity of all the grid is, um, in fact, dependent on the uh, weakest uh, points. It means the bottlenecks. So if the bottlenecks in the neighboring grids are not uh, eliminated, uh, we, we can't do anything with that. And here it's also um, 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 associated with the uh, construction permission or construction licensing um, um, uh, system. It's not a problem only in our country. It uh, takes uh, about 10 years normally. In uh, Germany, uh, um, there was about 15, uh, sorry, 18 years ago, there was uh, the um, research made uh, which clearly determined the bottlenecks. But the bottlenecks uh, um, um, have been maintained there up to now. Uh, so uh, the enhancement of the uh, network is not the only um, solution. But if we want to, uh, be, uh, to develop the renewables, we uh, have also develop our network and grid in uh, the same um, uh, rate. And here the problem is not in the construction, but in the process of permission issuance. And then uh, there is uh, the uh, issue of uh, the resources which are able to replace the fossil uh, fuel. Uh, we uh, we are speaking about the accumulation, accumulation in the form of batteries, accumulation, and uh, the storage of uh, uh, this uh, electricity. And um, the issue is that uh, during the day when uh, the solar energy is uh, is uh, running. Um, uh, we need to store this uh, energy uh, through the system which will allow its cycling and the hydrogen uh, um, um, hydrogen energy also has to be used there and we have to be able to split uh, this uh, uh, this uh, energy distribution in time and here uh, we also have to think about balancing. We are dragging behind it in many countries, as for instance in Denmark, uh, some balancing of resources is already taking place. Uh, we are still dragging down in this. Uh, another thing is uh, the interconnection of markets. Uh, at this moment, uh, uh, there is this interconnection in uh, the uh, um, in uh, the markets with the uh, regulated energy. But what we need to interconnect is uh, the markets of the uh, reserve energy. You know, to interconnect the market and the uh, reserve energy, that's the very problem. Uh, only Germany, uh, Czech Republic and Austria are involved in these systems. Other countries are still uh, waiting and uh, have not been have not connected uh, their grids to uh, these uh, systems and last but not least is uh, the artificial intelligence systems development because 
today the co-production um, is uh, uh, performed by the power plants with predictable production cycles but in the future we will be more dependent on the productions which will be unpredictable because it will depend on the weather conditions and uh, for that we need to have the systems which will be based on the artificial uh, intelligence and last but not least we need uh, the possibility to uh, uh, develop the distribution uh, grids uh, because today the connection of the renewables is in fact uh, limited uh, by the possibility to connect the, the new uh, uh, renewables. Today uh, there are about 12,000 of megawatts connected and another three, four megawatts uh, are planned to be connected but Without the development of the possibility to, to accumulate and to store this energy, we will face the uh, limits uh, of the uh, grid capacity. But if we want to reach 20, 25 uh, uh, thousand of megawatts from uh, uh, um, solar um, photovoltaic uh, uh, resources, we will have to uh, build up the storage uh, capacities. Uh, well, at this moment, um, at this moment we are uh, investing into storage, but it's not sufficient. We will have to enhance the network to increase the, the transmission capacities, but we will need to uh, take some other measures so uh, without which uh, the few economy of future would not be uh, possible so if we expect that in 10 years uh, the uh, renew, uh, the share of renewables will be multiplied uh, 10 or even more times we uh, have to uh, cover all these components which have been mentioned here today. Okay, let me give the floor to Martin Bursik uh, from OZE Chamber, the, the RES Chamber. So, um, First of all, I'd like to say thank you to the Senate as an organizer, and uh, namely to Itka Saitlova, the Vice President, and Zdenia Klinhart, the Chairman of the Committee on Public Administration, Regional Development, and uh, the Environment. It's really great because you create or you help us create a platform to discuss these important topics. I really uh, feel great here amongst you. And if I compare it to the 18 days that I spent uh, in Egypt uh, uh, in the Sharm el Sheikh uh, at COP27, I just, you know, y you can't compare it, these two locations. Not just the location itself, but uh, also the people, because it wasn't that easy with the Egyptians. Uh, we returned just really a few hours ago and I lack at least two nights of good sleep, so I apologize in advance for maybe being slower in my thinking. Uh, I was uh, leading the negotiators uh, on behalf of the Czech presidency in the Council of the EU, and it was really difficult. And it was most difficult in that area that we're most interested in, and that is that we're just lagging behind when it comes to decarbonization. Globally, we're not developing areas uh, fast enough. Uh, the temperatures are going up. Globally, the planet is on fire. And we wanted to promote a, a strategic objective. And that is that global emissions would peak in 2025. That is the latest deadline that uh, the uh, that the panel recommended and it was not approve, uh, approved and uh, also we were not able to have approved a proposal presented by our indian colleagues uh, concerning the deadline of uh, 
complete phasing out of fossil fuels. And also when it comes to the fund uh, for the poorer countries, uh, that fund was designed by China mainly, and the money would go to China and Saudi Arabia and India because the whole fund was designed uh, um, based on what the world looked like in 1991 uh, when uh, we had the conference in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, if we adopted that fund as it was designed, that would really be funny, in my opinion. So. Um, to further elaborate on uh, what uh, the previous speaker said, I believe that Europe has never been so united as it is today. Uh, the war in Ukraine helped it a lot and our response to it. But what also helps a lot, in my opinion, is the overall architecture of the climate policy here in Europe, because we've developed that policy quite quickly. And apart from Fit for 55, package. And by the way, nine out of 10 uh, citizens of the Czech Republic are not aware of it. They don't know what it is. But in that package, we have um, 14 basic uh, legislative acts or amendments to European pieces of legislation. And altogether, that should provide or should guarantee the decrease of emissions by 55%. So apart from that, uh, in reaction to the war in Ukraine, uh, uh, Europe adopted uh, Repower EU and uh, uh, Christine von der Leyen said that it's really like repowering the EU that is increasing the, our ambitions. For example, increasing uh, the share of uh, renewable sources of energy from 40 to 45 percent and savings, uh, increasing them from 9 to 13 percent. Uh, but it also mentions um, solar strategy. And again, based on our experience with Russia and our dependence on uh, fossil fuels, in solar, we are also dependent on one significant supplier, and that's China. And roughly 85% of uh, money that Europe invests into photovoltaic panels and other components of solar systems comes from China. So that is, again, a security risk. So a large portion of uh, um, silicon ingot ingots are um, manufactured in Xinjiang uh, in forced labor camps uh, where you have over one million of Muslims in those camps. So um, governments of various countries already um, activated embargoes uh, on imports of, of, of those goods and so forth. So uh, that's one, one thing that I wanted to mention. And uh, we also have to uh, consider the fact that the Czech Republic is an industrial country. We keep repeating that. Uh, we're proud of that. Of course, that also means that uh, we're carbon carbon intense as, um, as an economy, and we lack a fast developing renewable sources of energy um, sector. Of course, we are doing something. Uh, we're uh, manufacturing heat pumps. We're manufacturing components for solar uh, power plants, but we could do much more. And if we want to have a complete transformation to renewable sources of energy, then uh, why not use that opportunity to its full? Uh, the government could define uh, the, its strategy for developing renewable sources of energy and uh, the whole industrial sector and support it, support it more than w what it's been doing so far. So it's still up to the government to make the fundamental decisions. It's good to follow trends um, globally, and uh, it's something that I really enjoy. And if you look at Bloomberg and New Energy fi Finances, International Energy Agency and their forecasts, uh, you can see that there are three major driving forces of the transformation of uh, energy and uh, economy in the world. And that's uh, cheap, cheap energy uh, in in the past decade, uh, we've 
decreased. We've seen decreasing the cost of energy by 85 percent, but then also low costs. Uh, of course, uh, COVID um, changed the scene a little bit, and the increasing cost of energy recently, increasing costs of trans uh, transportation and so forth. But if you look at uh, the curves, I believe that the trend is quite uh, quite obvious. What does that mean for the Czech Republic? We have some 17.3 percent of renewable sources of energy. It's it's its share on the gross consumption of energy. Uh, electricity on its own is 14.3 percent. The Repower EU package uh, that uh, aims at 45 percent share of uh, renewable sources of energy on the overall consumption. So if you recalculate that and distribute it fairly according to a model that uh, features five parameters, uh, by the way, the Technical University in Vienna uh, is doing these calculations. So in the Czech Republic, we should reach 35 percent, the share of uh, renewable sources of energy. So that basically means that we will have to double uh, the share um, of renewable sources of energy by the end of uh, uh, by the end of the year. By and then, as our colleagues presented, by 2030, uh, the main driving force for decarbonization will be electrical energy. So basically, in mobility, e-cars will be dominating. And uh, I know from my studies of um, environmental um, science, uh, the it is good to have more alternatives developing because diversity is important. And so hydrogen will be important, synthetic fuels for airlines, for example. And for heating, it will be heat pumps. The trend is quite obvious. And maybe to a limited extent uh, with uh, a much more strict uh, criteria for sustainability. We could uh, also use biomass, and it is included in uh, the Fit for 55 package. If you know the criteria in that hierarchy, uh, using biomass, um, energy usage of biomass is the last one amongst the priorities. If there's nothing else left, what you can do with it? And in the energy sector, we are really late bloomers. If you look at uh, the National Climate Plan that the previous government presented, it states that electricity from renewable sources of energy should increase by 2% by 2030. So that's absolutely insufficient. So that's why that plan will be reviewed uh, next year. So, um, Plans and strategies, that's one thing, but we also have to develop uh, an environment uh, prone or suitable for development. So the first amendment uh, that was already mentioned uh, uh, is, um, go it went through the second reading. It is uh, awaiting the third reading. Uh, that is the change of uh, 10 kilowatt to 50 kilowatt. Uh, sources and uh, the change of uh, their categorization and uh, the simplification of uh, the permitting process. So you will not need that comprehensive building permit uh, if uh, you, you want to build a small source. And uh, the European Commission some 10 days ago published a draft resolution. I don't know whether you've noticed. And in that draft, uh, regulation. Uh, they combined uh, uh, various elements of uh, other regulations, and uh, it mentions that, for example, if uh, you want to build a photovoltaic uh, source and uh, you are not an energy company, so producing energy is not your primary business. Uh, the, the permitting process should be simplified uh, and it shouldn't take more than three months. And there were also some 
other progressive moments, I would say. And then also amendment of the Energy uh, Act number two. It's going through the comments proceedings. Uh, it should end by the 5th of uh, December. And uh, that amendment defines two types of energy societies or energy organizations. Um, one of which is the Community Energy Society, and um, it is well defined in that amendment. And it, I believe that it could bring a positive revolution in the Czech Republic. Um, also, those so-called active customers, uh, those that produce as well as consume. So the whole principle is that uh, you can produce your own electricity and if you don't use all of it, you can supply it to the grid, to the distribution system, and somebody else can use it. And of course, uh, uh, it, it, it reduces your overall energy bill and uh, they pay only some distribution fees. So that is a model, for example, for uh, the, the cottage owners. Uh, it's a very attractive model for them. So we're hopefully going to eliminate uh, the biggest barrier, uh, that is the lengthy permitting process. And one last idea. I have no doubts that we're heading for renewable sources of energy. Um, there are many people doubting that we can have a system that runs 100% on renewable sources of energy, but I really believe that we can achieve that. Of course, the nuclear power plants will be existing and running for some time. Nobody's doubting that. But it's obvious that we're heading for renewable sources of energy. And now the question is, who's going to own these renewable sources? And uh, the idea of... Um, energy companies that they can simply switch from fossil fuels to, for example, from coal to solar, uh, that is quite naive because the overall transition of the energy system uh, must be based on the existence of uh, thousands and dozens of thousands of micro power plants, micro sources that will produce energy that will be shared by by the others in the grid. So I'll be looking forward to uh, meeting and seeing all of you in the process of transition. So thank you. And the floor goes to Eliška Beranová from Frank Bolt. Good afternoon to everybody. It's an honor for me to speak here about one of the uh, passions, and namely about the community energy. Um, I am glad that I can work for the experts group Frank Bold, where we are dealing with the big uh, challenges, um, so, social challenges and namely now uh, the transformation to uh, the uh, energy, um, green uh, green energy. At this moment, uh, we see that the situation has developed so bad that it can't be worse. And then here is some positive catalyst and positive changes start to take place and we believe that these changes will be revolutionary ones in the positive sense of the word. I am speak up, speaking about community energy as one of the tools allowing us to reach better energy security, self-sufficiency in uh, the Czech Republic. As Oh, um, I would like to start with uh, mentioning some, or oh, adding something to uh, the present situation uh, as uh, mentioned here today. Today, uh, we see that uh, many of the community energy projects can't be 
uh, implemented because uh, there is the lack of the legal uh, framework. Uh, but now the Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade has already drafted uh, Lex uh, Rest, which will allow uh, um, the implementation of this community energy sector. I believe it will be hard work in uh, respect of the legislation process because the changes which this new bill uh, should bring uh, will, in fact, um, shock the uh, centralized energy uh, industry. And we believe that this centralized energy industry will strive to slow down this process. So uh, here you can see two figures. I would like to ask you to guess what uh, do these two figures mean? The first one, can you guess? Yes, that's number of municipalities we have in the Czech Republic. And the second one, um, well, nearly a quarter of a million. Well, there is no bad answer, so try to answer it. Anything which comes to your mind. So there was the tip, uh, number of customers. So I will help you. This is the number of blocks of uh, flats in the Czech Republic. So in all these areas, the community energy uh, can be uh, implemented. So the communities and the blocks of flats can be uh, the basis for the community energy sector. But you can imagine it also as uh, some uh, housing, uh, residential parts of the bigger cities or uh, the roofs of the uh, shopping centers and so on. So. There can be many places where the community energy can be implemented, but uh, the municipalities uh, and the blocks of flats are the core places where the community energy could be um, used. Um, so there was some study made uh, focusing on what could be the output of the community uh, energy. Uh, in few in the future, so in gigawatts, could you could you guess what eighteen? It's not the community energy. So, community energy sector can represent seven point uh, five gigawatts out of the eighteen gigawatts which have been mentioned here previously. So we are speaking only about the. Uh, premises of municipalities and uh, the uh, residential blocks of flats. So just for your imagination, this is the output of 10 big coal power, uh, electricity producing power plant. So this volume can cover the needs of 80% of households in respect of the electricity consumption. So this is great potential which we have here in the Czech Republic. And now I would like to mention what we need to do to bring this to life. I am a lawyer, so I look at this issue from the uh, lawyer's uh, uh, point of view. And what we are missing now is legislation which would allow us to implement the community energy um, in to our country. And the new Energy Act uh, needs to contain four basic pillars. The first one is the definition of the community energy sector. 
it has to be functional it has to respect the projects uh, which have been already implemented here as the pilot ones despite of the legal vacuum existing here so it should not go against the existing projects uh, but should support them and um, develop them furthermore so in this respect uh, the draft uh, uh, presented by the um, Ministry of Industry and Trade is a very quality one. So the definition as proposed now in this draft bill is really um, very good. And then, as uh, Martin Bosik mentioned here, is, uh, cre uh, is to create the um, facilities for sharing uh, the electricity in order people do not uh, need to build up their private uh, uh, electricity networks. For instance, if I have the uh, electricity producing facility on my roof, I should be able to share this electricity produced with my neighbor if I'm not at home and he needs the electricity at that moment. And this is exactly what the new act or the new bill of uh, on energy um, also includes. And thanks to these provisions, uh, the stability of the transmission network is also improved because the electricity does not need, uh, need to be uh, transmitted to big distances. And the third task, uh, uh, which needs to be solved also to the future, is the elimination of uh, obsolete uh, administrative uh, barriers, which really are the burden to all people who want to be involved in the energy sector and apply for some um, um, uh, approvals. Because as the Act, uh, as the Energy Act is drafted at this moment, it uses the word, wording of um, the specialists uh, who have the sp uh, energy education and so on. So that's why we need to have this um, act uh, um, stipulated in the very simple way in order uh, people with no professional education in energy could understand it as well and could be able to implement it in practice. And now I would like to skip some of my slides because I think I've spoken for a long time already. I would like to make some um, conclusion saying that if the um, amendment uh, to the Act is adopted, will face a lot of challenges in its implementation. And for that, we will need the um, uh, accumulation, the storage capacities, aggregation, um, uh, the smart measuring, and flexibility. Um, well, what's also important is uh, the uh, um, arrow uh, regulation, which will be valid uh, from the 1st of January uh, 23, um, which will allow uh, the um, um, communities of the residential houses um, uh, of several flats to build up their own photovoltaic on the roof and then to share it within the uh, house. So this will be the first step towards the community energy sector development. I would like to thank Eliska and all uh, the previous speakers. I think they all deserve uh, applause. Now uh, we will turn to the panel discussion, uh, which I would like to start with some questions I've already prepared. And at the same time, I will ask you to consider your questions um, so, uh, you would like to raise. Uh, if you want to raise a question, you will have to go to the microphone here in the center of the hall in order it's heard to everybody. 
So let me start with the first question. And it's uh, either on Martin Bursik or on Chris Roslow. We've heard a lot about the costs of transformation, the cost of the transition, but we haven't heard a lot about uh, the risks. So what could we do as a Czech Republic to decrease, to mitigate the risk of the transition? Just as, for example, lessons learned from the war in, in Ukraine. Okay, well, maybe just a small comment on this. Something I wanted to say previously uh, during my speech. I think that uh, we will probably not reach a situation that we would be completely independent of imports uh, of um, any kind of fuel or materials. Somebody touched on the issue that uh, we're importing uh, materials or spare parts uh, for uh, photovoltaic panels and so forth. And we have to bear that on mind. Um, and uh, our experience with uh, that, what I would call geopolitical uh, naivety, uh, that's, uh, that's a lesson for us that we have to learn from. Uh, that's about how not to do things. I'm calling it geopolitical naivety, being geopolitically naive. Uh, because uh, there were moments in the past uh, when we really thought that we don't have to consider the source of gas and it's okay to take gas from whoever because uh, countries that trade with each other will never fight against each other. And uh, uh, the same was in Germany, Wandel um, Handel policy. And uh, we know that it doesn't work. We can see it doesn't work. And uh, Germany was also geopolitically naive quite a lot uh, when they started building Nord Stream 2. Uh, the, the agreement was signed in 2015, one year after the Russian annexation of Crimea. So that's maybe a pessimistic opening of the discussion rather than an answer to your question. So definitely there are risks related to the transition, but uh, at least we know how to avoid them for the future. That is, we must not ignore the geopolitical risks because we can see that the geopolitical blocks are again activating themselves and that energy and uh, uh, raw materials uh, used in the energy sector could be used for blackmailing. So we should not go back to the situation as it was in the past. Pavel Scholz. Well, let me highlight one specific risk that uh, we haven't talked about enough in the times of transition, and that's uh, lack of uh, HR, of human resources. We want to build a lot. We want to expand our distribution networks. We, we want to massively install uh, smart elements such as smart meters. We want to replace a few million of smart meters within a few years, but we don't realize that in the end there will have to be a person, a human being doing that work. So apart from uh, lack of raw materials, I can see a huge risk in uh, the lack of people. It will complicate things and it will slow things down. There will be lack of staff, especially expert staff. Uh, for example, people need it for uh, electrical uh, electrical assembly of various smart um, elements and uh, and we can see the situation in photovoltaics or heat pumps that we lack uh, people experts uh, doing the installations well if i may comment on that this is not a problem only in the czech republic this is a problem of the whole european policy and I would really recommend everyone to study in detail the European architecture, what, for example, the European Commission produces. And the speed is extraordinary. I think it was back in 29, uh, 2011, in June, I believe, when they presented Fit for 55. So the, the speed is huge. And I remember when we developed uh, the first energy community, which is already running, up and running. Uh, they have um, an agreement with uh, the Prague Energy Company, PRE, 
And they did it even without uh, the legislation. And I also uh, took part in a one-day training at Kladno, close to Prague. It was a training for electricians, people that do maintenance for Prague, a company called El Todo. And these electricians were trained uh, within a couple of days. They received their certificate and uh, they're installing the photovoltaic systems quite quickly. And there are training courses for that and electricians are very much interested. But apart from this, of course, it's a question for wider education and, you know, apprentice branches. It's a huge segment uh, that uh, that could be um, that could bring uh, many opportunities for for the education and the change of it. It could be a big business. If you look at the overall volume of um, technologies and the energy savings, uh, renewable sources of energy, power to X, uh, storage, uh, hydrogen, uh, e-mobility, basically all. Uh, the elements of uh, all the pieces of the puzzle of the new decarbonized world. Uh, we come to trillions of dollars uh, that uh, that is an opportunity for us. It's a huge business and we should uh, use that business. Chris? Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with all the responses so far. I, I would just add um, on how on how to mitigate the risks. Well, the risks can, can be can be different. They can be technological, social, or political. Um, uh, and I think the way to to mitigate that is through diversifying the solutions that are that are employed. So, no single technology or no single source of energy will be the answer. Um, uh, so, I think what is needed is is a plan. It's a plan that is based on robust evidence and science and that importantly has the support of, of politicians, but also of ordinary people so that there is that social license for that plan to be, to be um, executed. And I, I think also any discussion of the risks of the transition needs to be discussed alongside the risks of not doing the transition. So the increased risk of climate breakdown if we don't make this change, which um, yeah, is, is, is kind of important context for the whole discussion of, of, of these risks. Thank you. As the time is running, I would like to give or dedicate space to your questions. Well, please come to microphone. Good afternoon, Andrzej Pasek, uh, uh, Duha, the Rainbow Movement. I would like to ask Mr. Schultz, we've heard that the energy security can't be the sole uh, issue of the Czech Republic lonely. So what CHEPS is uh, preparing, uh, the Czech transmission system operator is preparing for the um, enhancement of our connection to the European network. And what will be the requirements of CHIPS to enhance the uh, energy security and to expand the possibility of uh, uh, utilization of the renewable resources? What will be your uh, inputs uh, to the national um, energy plan, uh, which was uh, uh, developed in 2014. As regards the uh, uh, cross-border connection, the problem is not at the border. At this moment, the problem lays on German side and partially on Austrian side. So what we need at this moment is uh, the uh, enhancement of uh, their capacities. At this moment, uh, we've uh, uh, initiated the negotiations concerning uh, the um, uh, transmission uh, of 220 uh, kilovolts to 400 kilovolts uh, grid, uh, but that what no, was not. A, uh, but the discussions have to continue because in the past uh, Austria perceived this requirement from the Czech Republic as the uh, danger of the 
nuclear energy flow to uh, Austria from the Czech Republic. So at this moment, uh, they've uh, changed the approach. So we started uh, the process, but the process uh, of uh, the uh, licensing will uh, uh, last for many years. Uh, usually it uh, lasts uh, for eight years up to now. But by the way, Austrians are uh, really the champions in this respect because one um, line of their network uh, was uh, but the licensing for one line of the network uh, took uh, about 20 years. And the second problem is in Germany, because until Germans uh, um, enhanced their uh, national grid, they would not uh, support the idea of the trans-border uh, connection points enhancement. As regards Slovakia, we are also negotiating these issues. Um, uh, we are uh, negotiating uh, all these things um, um, uh, with respect to the perspective of 2030. Uh, and in the meantime, we are um, enhancing our own uh, national network in order when all these uh, cross-border connections uh, uh, are installed, we uh, would not face the bottleneck in our internal uh, network. So that's what we will propose to the state Niger energy concept. Well, as uh, already mentioned here, we are not uh, the uh, one of the institutions which um, can comment uh, the drafts, but uh, we, our professional position is um, taken into account. But if we want to have the electricity produced from the solar panels, it seems that we will have the surpluses of the production at the same moment as Germany or uh, Austria. So there will be nowhere to transmit this uh, energy. So we will need some storage uh, capacity, some accumulators, where we will be able to um, um, accumulate this energy in the systemic way. So as we planned the uh, um, fast growth, we also need to uh, have the policy which will allow us to develop the uh, um, energy accumulation and storage facilities. And then the question is how to assure uh, the sufficient volumes and capacity of all these facilities. You know, the hydrogen economy, probably some re-pumping um, 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 stations will need to be installed. And all that has to be prepared in advance. That's one of the important things. So uh, the enhancement of the grid, uh, permission processes and uh, focus on the storage. So if I can um, add to it, I do not agree with in three points with Mr. Schultz. You know, it's a little bit more discussion here. You know, um, in Austria at this moment, they have about 72% of electricity produced uh, from the uh, renewable resources and namely uh, hydro power plants, uh, water power plants, small ones, uh, because they have a lot of uh, small rivers in the mountains. So they are quite small country in that uh, respect. So they are not dependent on uh, uh, our electricity. As you mentioned, you, uh, uh, as you mentioned, photovoltaic and the need of accumulation, um, there the uh, production can be big, um, um, large uh, by uh, small uh, uh, small producers and uh, even the big ones. But we should not forget the wind energy and or electricity from wind. And speaking about uh, the uh, accumulation. Look at California, for instance. They do not have the same output as the storage capacity. And today we have the 
we have the uh, uh, draft uh, of the uh, bill which uh, supposes to have the massive uh, uh, capacities for electromobility uh, installed by that time. Okay, so I, I, I will let you be creative, but I don't know whether we have enough time for, for the discussion. And I would really love to give the floor to Mrs. Um, Saitlova, the senator. Well, first of all, many thanks for the discussion because it's really fruitful. Storage of energy, that's something that we definitely will need to develop. I'm aware of that. But uh, I have another question. It concerns the current situation. Two thirds of the country is covered by uh, distribution services provided by your company, and uh, the other third is uh, served by an Austrian company, Austrian distribution company, and that distributor allows you to sell for spot prices uh, if you are connected to the grid as a producer. Your company does not allow it. Uh, you have um, regulated prices, and uh, th that's a problem because the citizen cannot uh, choose. The person doesn't have a choice. It depends on where he or she is located and uh, which uh, distribution company serves that location. And I see it as a big problem. So I would love to see uh, you agreeing and uh, going in the same direction as uh, the Austrian distributor in South Moravia. I understand what you're saying about the bottlenecks, that the bottlenecks are mainly um, abroad on the other side of the border. So I, for example, I am waiting, I've been waiting for a few months to be connected to a distribution network. And uh, at the roundtable discussions, we were, for example, hearing that, uh, uh, that North Moravia has full capacities um, used when it comes to building solar plants or wind plants, uh, simply saying, if you want to build a new plant, uh, you will not be allowed to do that because the overall capacity has been used up. And uh, we were discussing possible solutions to that problem uh, because the new act or the amendment of the old one will not um, help the situation. And also the large distributors are resistant to changing their systems of operations. And maybe a comment. We keep saying that we're dependent on Russian gas. But uh, recently, we have heard uh, in political, political commentaries that uh, we also lack uh, sources of raw materials. And uh, some of the previous speakers mentioned it as well. Simply, if we want to have a developed uh, sector of renewable sources of energy or, for example, nanotechnologies and so forth, we need precious metals. And 90% uh, of the sources of these metals either are owned by China or are managed by China. So Martin and uh, Mr. Yerushek and Mr. Scholz would be happy for that as well. Uh, it, it would be good if we discuss it at the European level, because it's a strategic problem and we have to solve it for the future. Well, I apologize, but uh, I left uh, chess two years ago. I spent four years with chess and now I am with CHEPS, which is the Czech transmission system operator. And I cannot do much uh, about what you're saying. We don't do trade. We're not a trading company. We're just the distributor. Uh, it also needs to be said that uh, if you're operating a photovoltaic plant, uh, you can choose your trading company. So you can trade with E.ON and uh, provide your electricity to E.ON and uh, Chess distribution company cannot prevent you from doing that. Why Chess Prode, the trader, is 
operating in the way that they do and why they don't do it as E.ON, well, that's a question. I don't know. I uh, used to work for chess, but for chess distribution. And with the distribution company, the problem is that uh, the system um, has been developed and built for decades. And uh, uh, I have to use a combination of hard and soft uh, measures to, to change it. The problem is that the distribution, uh, distribution system is um, uh, like, um, it's like a snow, well, it's like a snowflake or um, it, it has one center and from that center you have um, arms going in all directions and it's a problem of the stability of voltage. So at the very end of one branch, uh, when the sun is shining, the voltage will be maximum at the maximum level. And at the other ends, uh, the voltage will fluctuate. And I have to use all sorts of smart elements to balance out the voltage. Maybe I'll be able to use a huge battery to stabilize the voltage, but everything that I can use will cost a lot of money. And uh, I cannot use soft elements to solve it all. I have to use hard elements. So I will have to um, better interconnect the current grid. So it's a problem that, uh, that requires solution that will take me years, many years to, to implement. The current grid does not allow me to increase the parameters. And if I want to increase the parameters, I need to do some digging up and uh, do hard measures. And that requires a permitting process. The permitting process, again, takes a few years, for example. So we have 12,000 megawatts uh, allowed. That's the capacity, and uh, we still have maybe some capacity left in some locations. In other locations, I have nothing left. So it's a question of how fast I'll be able to strengthen the distribution grid. And uh, of course, the distribution companies will receive money for that in the end, uh, but it's a question of uh, uh, design capacities. We may have a uh, lack of uh, designers. Uh, the permitting process will take a long time, and the, all the distributors have to coordinate all these efforts. So if we don't speed up all of these processes, we will in the end use up all the capacities that we have. We can help, we can help it a little bit with soft elements to balance out uh, the voltage at the nodes. So we can add a few thousands of megawatts. But if we speak about not 12,000, but let's say 25,000, uh, we cannot achieve that without further development of the distribution distribution grid. So if we think about it today and focus on it and do what we can, then maybe uh, just the first wave will be slower and then we will catch up. But we have to start doing it right now. And of course, the wind plants, wind uh, power plants are a more stable source. Yes, of course. But um, it's a source that can provide higher um, higher volume of uh, of, uh, of energy in relation to or in comparison with other sources and uh, I hope that we'll be able to promote this source more so I'm just telling you realistically what uh, we can expect and what we can do. There are barriers when it comes to wind, wind farms uh, because the permitting processes are really, really complex. It's not that the wind farms don't have sufficient potential. It's the process, the permitting process in particular, that is the barrier. Okay, thanks for the question. Time is running up. Uh, if you have uh, any further questions, and if the speakers, the panelists, have time after the end of the conference, you can try to talk to them afterwards. But uh, for the time being, let me say thank you to all the speakers, uh, Martin Brusik and Chris Roslow, who connected online, then Pavel Schultz, Pavel Schultz Martin Brusik and Eliška Beranova, and Mr. Jirušek as well. So a big applause to all of them. I think it's deserved. So let me pass the floor to Miriam. So before we officially close down the conference, I'd like to give the floor to 
Zbigniew Linhart, Senator, uh, for the closing word. Mr. Linhart is the chair of the Committee on Public Administration, Regional Development and the Environment of the Senate of the Parliament of the Czech Republic. So the floor is yours. So, good evening. I apologize once again for coming late, but uh, in the Czech Switzerland area, it's not just forests that uh, sometimes burn down. But yesterday, in my uh, municipality, a gymnasium burnt down a sporting facility. So, I had to be there and solve it. So, I apologize for not being here during the first panel. I was listening to the second panel, and I have to agree with everything that uh, have that has been said. Uh, sometimes it looks like uh, things are going against each other and clashing, but uh, we simply have to clarify things because you have potential on one hand, you have possibilities on the other hand, and we have to see everything in, in an overall context. When it comes to energy, it's not just about ecology and the environmental aspects. It's not just about security, but also about social aspects relating to the old or energy issue. Uh, I could speak for a long time, but since uh, we don't have time, uh, I will just maybe have a few comments or maybe not. <laughs> okay, okay, I will say just a few things, even though we're running late. Okay, if you try to be as brief as possible, that would be great. Okay, I, I'll give you just one comment or maybe three. We'll see. I'll start with the first one. So 13 years ago, uh, the Czech Republic was presiding in the Council of uh, uh, the EU. And you might recall that we had a big challenge back then, and that was a gas crisis. And what has changed in the past 13 years? Well, not much. And many of the problems became even worse because we have not been solving them. So the current situation is worse than it was 13 years ago. And we can look at Germany, for example, our neighbor. And uh, let's um, look at what Germany has been doing. It's a huge economy. So, of course, uh, whether we want it or not, they influence our economy in the Czech Republic. So, uh, under the pretext of green economy and uh, um, phasing out uh, fossil fuels and uh, nuclear fuel, and they massively switched to uh, energy from Russia, energy sources from Russia. On the other hand, we were adopting sanctions against Russia and Russia and, and Germany was at the same time deciding about building Nord Stream 2 and other investments in Russia. And as a result, uh, we are where we are today. And uh, of course, they didn't want to hear about uh, greenhouse gases at all, not just when burning gas, but also when mining, for example, methane and storing methane. Were we able to talk about it back then? No. Were we able to listen to the criticism? No. Uh, one year ago, um, we were debating the Fit for 55 here in the Senate, the 14 packages or 14 parts of the overall package. And I selected for myself the European Climate Fund. Uh, of course, the other topics are also very important and interesting, and we can have many ideas, beautiful ideas, but if we're not managing the social impact well, then we cannot succeed. And the European Commission, and that was well beyond uh, the war, the European Commission expected that uh, the negative impact of the transition will be huge. And it is huge. Even after 33 years of the fall of the Iron Curtain, we have to admit that the, the gap between the East and the West uh, remains huge. And unfortunately, the gap is huge also within countries. For example, in the Czech Republic, we have huge gaps. For example, when it when you look at uh, Northwest, that's a region that lags behind, uh, even though there are hundreds of billions of crowns that potentially should go to that region to develop it, often the money ends up elsewhere. So if we, so are we going to do the green energy in the same way? Are we going to be consistent? Uh, will we admit to ourselves that we're making a mistake and fix it? Because if not, then it will not work. I live in a region where, where you have dozens of per percent uh, of, of population that earn up to 1,000 euro a month. And uh, 
they don't have a problem whether they will buy uh, photovoltaic panels uh, for their house. They have a problem because they don't have money to fix their roof, for example, to, to, so that it doesn't, lo doesn't leak. And, okay, comment number three. Do I have time? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm coming from the Sudetenland, uh, Lande, uh, the northwest of Bohemia, and uh, you were talking about the permitting process, and Mr. Scholz will know it, I think. For 25 years, we've been preparing a new line, power line, that should replace the old uh, 35 kilo, kilovolt uh, uh, line, because it keeps breaking down, and it has taken 25, even 30 years, and we still do not have um, even the territorial permit, uh, the location permit, because there are certain technical limits, and uh, we simply haven't progressed anywhere in the past 25 years. So looking at the energy system in the northwest region, how do you want to solve it if we're not able to built the lines in 25 years, and not even that, we still don't have the permit. I live in the city of Krasna Lipa, and recently we've been saying to ourselves, well, we would wish that people use coal to heat their houses. And we're saying that after so many years when we wanted to phase out uh, coal, uh, and we were hoping that it will be phased out as soon as possible. And uh, it will take probably a shorter, shorter time to phase out coal, but uh, right now, at this moment, uh, we were hoping that people switch back to coal for all those reasons um, and all those problems that we have in, in that region. When it comes to uh, nuclear energy, um, yes, uh, we're uh, listening to all the arguments um, why it should be supported and uh, it's, uh, what should be supported from the Fair Transition Fund. Uh, it's an EU contribution to the transition, and Germany co-finances that fund uh, in the volumes uh, of money 35 times larger than what the Czech Republic can afford. So what we're paying to the transition from our national sources is really a very small amount compared to other, other countries. So there will be no transition if we don't um, give more money to that, in addition to what we're getting from the EU. But um, Time is up, and uh, we, we can have another discussion in the future. But what I want to say is that even though we do not understand each other sometimes, we all have to be aware of the overall potential of the transition and talk about it, just as we're doing today. So I hope to see you again in the Senate at some point. So once more, the floor to Miriam Matsurova. I know that the time is running. I would like to thank at the end to the Vice President of the Senate for the uh, auspices given to this uh, conference. So, Mrs. Uh, Vice President, thanks for the participation. We also would like to thank uh, to the Committee on Public Administration, Regional Development and Environment of the Senate for uh, providing us uh, these premises uh, for this conference. And also I would like to thank to all the organizers and the panelists uh, who uh, presented their professional view on the topic and for their professional position. Uh, uh, the <coughs> outcomes of this conference will be uh, reflected in the policy paper of this conference, which will be uh, distributed to you in the recent uh, days. And we believe that uh, Europe, as well as the Czech Republic, will manage to overcome 
and solve all the challenges mm -hmm. which have been mentioned here today. Thank you very much. And we would like to thank interpreters as well.